It is Tuesday afternoon, 4 p.m. in Switzerland, and it's Space Cafe Web Talk time. Our Space Cafe Web Talk, 33 minutes with Professor Kazuto Yasuzu. Again, 33 minutes with Professor Kazuto Suzuki will begin soon. Thanks for joining us and for taking your time for our talk today about space policy in Japan, the new challenges for setting international norms. As always, we appreciate your participation and your ongoing feedback. Any responses is very valuable for us and helps us to improve. I'm Torsten Kreening. I'm your host today, publisher of Spacewatch.global. We are a Switzerland-based online platform for information in and about space and new space activities in a geopolitical context. I know many of you are already familiar with our website, our bi-weekly and daily newsletters, and the Space Cafe podcasts. Our last Space Cafe podcast with Brother Guy the head of the Vatican Observatory was released last week and is a leak of, of its own. So worth to, what, uh, was worth to listen. Um, we also keep our fan shop open online for you to support us actively and become a space watcher. The edition one has cool items for you, your friends and the ones you love and your support is really needed. If you have missed any of our previous web talks, we have an archive available on our website in the event section and on YouTube. And we host our Space Cafe web talks live weekly. I'm very proud to announce my guest today. He is someone known for his strategic policy work, known for his extraordinary knowledge on space and military space policy. So it is my great pleasure to welcome Professor Kazuto Suzuki in Tokyo in my show today. And this time I made it without stumbling over your, um, your uh, name. Kazuto is Professor of Science and Technology Policy at the Graduate School of Public Policy at the University of Tokyo, Japan, and a Senior Fellow of the Asia Pacific Initiative, the Independent Policy Think Tank. He received his PhD from the Sussex Sussex European Institute, University of Sussex in England. He has worked in the foundation. And now, I don't speak French, so apologize if, <laughs> if that sounds strange. The Foundation pour la Research Strate Strategique in Paris, France, as an assistant researcher and the associate professor at the University of Tsukuba. And he worked as a professor of international politics at Hokkaido University until recently last year. He served as an expert on the panel of experts for the I Iran Sanction Committee under the United Nations Security Council. And he's, his research focuses on the conjunction of science and technology and international relations subjects, including space policy, non-proliferation, export control and sanctions. Kazuto, once more, thank you for being my guest today. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. With great pleasure. Let's kick that off. So before we talk about the current Japanese space ambitions, please give us a quick overview where Japan comes from. I mean, I assume that one of the burdens of World War II for Japan similar to us here in Germany, was that access to early space technology was limited due to the dual U nat nature, I mean, as we would call it today. How did Japan become one of the leading space faring, space launching countries? Well, that's a, a very long history and uh, I'll, I'll just make it in a very quick form. Japan has a, um, a burden of the World War II, and that is reflected on the Constitution, particularly the Article 9, which renounced the engagement into the warfare. So Japan has set up the self-restriction on not developing the um, offensive capabilities, like you know, building a missiles, building the aircraft carrier, etc. <clears throat> And space is one of the um, sphere of the offensive capabilities because of the dual use nature. So Japan has um, set up the um, 
the Japanese diet, which is the parliament, the Japanese diet has um, <coughs> you, you, um, uh, unanimously decided that Japan should exclusively use uh, space for peaceful purposes. So exclusively peaceful purpose clause resolution was, uh, was adopted in 1969. And that includes not only the development or the development of own ownership and operation by the military, but also the use of the uh, space assets or space-based uh, space services by the military. So um, for many years- Just, just to Japanese, be clarified, that, that also means weather services, GPS services, or navigation services, all, all of that commercially yep. available services, correct? Well, that was until 1955, uh, 1985. So okay. since 1985, it is, um, it has been allowed to, the military are allowed to use the commercially available services, but still it was ref refrained from um, um, uh, developing and owning and operating the military, um, the space mm -hmm. systems. So, but because of the importance of the space is now in, in you know, increasing in the in the modern uh, weapon systems and warfare, and uh, of course we do have the a very strong alliance with United States. And the um, 2007 there was a ASAT test by China, and there was uh, 2003 there was a. <clears throat> Uh, uh, nuclear um, nuclear experiments, nuclear tests in North Korea. So we needed to have the uh, you know reconnaissance satellites. We need to have mm -hmm. the communication satellite to to jointly working with United States. So um, in 2008, Japan Japanese Diet set up the new law called the Basic Space Law, which allows the Japanese military to uh, to. Uh, to use and own and operate the uh, space systems, but it was only in 2008, and ever since the J Japan, uh, Japan has invested in uh, in space for the mostly on the uh, space situational awareness. So we we are building the SSA capabilities under the Ministry of Defense, but we haven't really have the uh, we we only have one. Uh, dedicated uh, satellite for military, but uh, uh, military doesn't own and operate the reconnaissance satellite or or any other um, uh, you know uh, space assets uh, other than the communication satellite. So this is how it is in Japan. Oh, okay, that's an interesting and very vibrant history, obviously. Let's move fast forward to our current situation, our current times. So yesterday we saw the uh, G7 nations, Japan included, during their meeting in Cornwall and commit to the safe and sustainable use of space. And so I think that's absolute awesome news for all of us in this sector that we have the heads of the leading companies of the world, uh, le leading countries, not companies of the world, <laughs> countries of the world um, committing to that. And today, uh, the head of JAXA talked at GLEX about the extensive exploration projects your country does. So great news, news for all of us. So what are the hottest space projects in Japan these days? Well, there are many things uh, which are ongoing. And one of which is the what uh, uh, Mr. Yamakawa, what Dr. Yamakawa, I should say, uh, who's, who spoke at the GLEX in uh, St. Petersburg. Um, it, which is the uh, project called MMX, which is the sample return from the Phobos, the um, the uh, moon of the Mars, and uh, uh, that is one of the uh, next project after Hayabusa 2, and that's one thing uh, we are working on. And the other thing is the removal of the um, space debris. The G7 uh, G7 announcement on the uh, you know the resolution or uh, uh, communique which are adopted by the G7 uh, mentioned about the safe and sustainable use and the British uh, fact sheets of this communique 
tells that it is the actual scale, which is based in Oxfordshire uh, uh, company, but the actual scale, uh, the, the, the headquarter of the actual scale is in Japan, in Tokyo, but the, uh, the, the one in the Oxfordshire is the, uh, the branch uh, or subsidiary in, in UK. But the UK subsidiary is now working on the ELSA D project, which is to the demonstration, technical demonstration of the debris removal, and which is now operating in, in orbit. Okay. So you mentioned astral scale, and um, we talked about our space situation awareness in various space cafes with Moriba, Ja, with, with mm -hmm. Darren Mc, McKnight, uh, and, and, and others. So and I mean, there is the technical challenges, but I mean, now we have, we see in Japan, um, a commercial company going yep. this path. And I mean, I had the pleasure to talk a few times with Nobu and was impressed by his charisma, I would say, aura and, and passion about it. And that's all good. But how can a commercial company make money out of space debris where we still haven't cataloged it pr uh, properly and know what it is about. So, well, I, I think we we know pretty much about the potentially very dangerous debris, and uh, we know who are who who send that in in orbit. But um, I think the um, the astro scales business model is basically the. Um, not just you know take out the anonymous debris, but it is to um, to remove the satellite which are defunct uh, by uh, for for some reasons, and to take out those uh, big debris. Um, and uh, some countries, um, some governments, which uh, consider the, the it's their responsibilities, like the Japanese government, for um, Adeos. Uh, launcher or upper stage of the H2A, um, the ESA, for example, for the Envisat, you know, those are the cases that the uh, governmental responsibility, you know, the, the, there is a, a, a certain responsibility lies in the government, so there will be a possibility to take out those, um, uh, uh, to take out those um, uh, debris. And also, the, there are uh, responsible companies which are now operating the small satellites, the mega constellation satellite uh, satellite system. And if there are some defunct uh, satellite which is remains in the orbit, then the the these companies will pay for the astro scale to remove those um, um, defunct satellites. So these are the possible uh, source of revenues, but. Uh, in the future, I think there'll be a sort of an establishment of the uh, understanding of what is responsible behavior in space, and which is now led by the UK and uh, adopted uh, last year in the UN, uh, UN uh, General Assembly about uh, the, the definition of the responsibility in space. And I think this is, uh, this is the sort of a step forward for for making this um, uh, debris removal as the act uh, as the actual business case. So yes, there is still uncertainty, but I think there will be a possibility that um, uh, astro scale will, can make money out of the uh, removal of debris under this uh, concept of the responsible behavior. I mean, on the other hand, I think it's 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 good to see that Astro Scale is pretty well financed, and an, a number of entities, including uh, the government, put uh, their 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 money on it to really to I think set the stage. But uh -huh. I mean, talking about active room active debris removal ADR, I mean, if I try to envision that um, here, then it is like having a small aircraft flying around really in, in space and uh, grabbing the, the things. And I mean, that's a technology uh, uh -huh. which is super advanced and also can be misused, absolutely, like uh -huh. everything. Uh, but here, 
I mean, I'm talking about the nature of, of the Japanese space policy before. So how do you differentiate that not to see it as a space weapon? And how does Japan avoid to see ADR in general as hostile activities? Because if you can take out an, an defunct satellite, yeah, you can take out any other satellite as well. Yeah, yeah exactly. I think um, that is... Um... That is the key issue uh, uh, for AstroScale to make a business case. Mm -hmm. And I think that it is an advantage or it is the sort of a um, leverage that the AstroScale has as the private company. If, for example, if this technology is developed by the big countries like, you know, US military or Chinese uh, People's Liberation Army, then people immediately find there'll be a certain, you know, um, intent in, in developing such technology. But the AstroScale is doing everything for the business. So if, you know, um, AstroScale is doing something which is unusual and not authorized and take out debris or take out the, any satellite, that will be, um, you know, the end of their business. So um, actually, it's uh, it's um, it's in a way that the uh, private company is engaged in um, active debris removal is the um, much better way than the national government involved. And also, it is because it is, the the activities are. are, are controlled and licensed by the Japanese government, which has the constitution, which refrain from the um, aggressive um, attempt to other country outside of the, uh, you know, if there is no case of the um, self-defense. So um, the uh, Japanese government has the very strong focus on mm. the transparency on this matter. Um, the transparency, I think, is the key, that you need to um, show what, e what your intent is, you need to, you know, disclose all the flight plans, you need to disclose the, the target debris, and you need to, you know, uh, live broadcasting all the information, which are, you know, uh, telling that, you know, where, the, what the satellites are doing and not harming anybody else. So that that is the sort of a uh, requirement for the Astro scale to be in the business and to be licensed by uh, Japanese government. So, uh, of course, this sort of a regulation is not yet in place, but it will be in the future, I, I, I believe. So, um, this sort of, a, um, you know, uh, uh, setting up the national regulatory system to ensure the transparency of the activities will prevent the astro scale to play around with this technology and um, and and and, and uh, to harm any other, you know, uh, potential. Um, uh, potential harm on the other business of the other governments or companies. So that's uh, that's how mm -hmm. you 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 can assure that uh, the, um, the active debris removal will not be used for the as a space weapon. I like that you mentioned transparency, and there are a number of discussions on norms of behavior and mm -hmm. a few of our friends. So I'll shoot out on here to, to Jessica West of, of PlugShare in, in Canada, who is in the audience today as well, or uh, Victoria Sampson and so on. They're going out on all the panels and talking about norms and behaviors and mm -hmm. also on, on the unity side. So, but let's make it concrete i mean one is to talk on the on the global level or with all the stakeholders involved but here we talk about japan as one country so how does uh -huh. japan ensure transparency in this global environment that is i mean in my opinion still focused on the interest of nation states oh uh, yes it is uh, uh, it is an interest of the nation state but look back in the last two decades, 
We have been engaged in the international discussion on the International Code of Conduct, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And yes, we have achieved the long-term sustainability guidelines. And the UK has launched this uh, um, initiative for the responsible responsible behavior in space. But still, there is very li limited opportunities to have the international consensus. And Meanwhile, we do have a lot of private companies launching thousands of satellites each year. And we are now having a serious problem of mm -hmm. congestion in, in the orbit. And uh, the risk of this uh, yeah, uh, issue of uh, uh, internet, you know, the space traffic management is just uh, on the way. And we need to do something and we can't wait until you know we we can't wait until the all the sets of sets and regu, you know the rules of and regulations are, are in place mm -hmm. and it will take another decade or longer you know i, I don't i don't know but you know i, I don't have a, a very high hope that it will make up soon so I think um, we need to have a new approach the, to to have the at least the transparent and established the um, uh, national regulation and the national regulatory um, authority is just giving all the information and uh, you know uh, uh, providing all the transparency and set the precedent and and of course you know it's not. It's not based on the internationally agreed uh, agreed uh, rules, but there's no rules. So it's, mm -hmm. um, you know, if you want to act, it, it, you know, it's, it's the, it, I, I think it's the pre precedent makes a, a big difference. If someone who has a malign intent and set the precedent, then it will go down in the road. But if someone who has the benign intent and doing everything it can to ensure that this is for the sake of the international public goods and uh, you know the safety of the flight in the in orbit i think this sort of a, a precedent need to be set so japan will unilaterally approach to you know to set the precedent and make as an example whether other countries follow or not, it's up to other countries. Uh, but at least it's a starting point. And mm -hmm. we need to take an action. We need to do something in order to start um, turning the things around. I mean, if we let the, you know, the satellite to be launched and, you know, the uh, many mega constellation starting to be um, uh, launching here and there and uh, you know thousands of satellites are up there and uh, many of them may go defunct in a few years that is not an ideal situation so i think it is uh, it is reasonable to do something and uh, and to go for it. So I would support the idea that the Japan will do as the you know as a harbinger and set the precedent and to be the reference point for the future activity in orbit. Wow. And um, I mean I'm not a politician nor that I'm an, a diplomat, obviously. Um, I must must say a um, big shootout and, and and chapeau for this for this brave move um, of of Japan. So I mean the last weeks uh, we have seen in Vienna the partially a uh, physical meeting of the legal subcommittee this year of UN Copio. So mm -hmm. new initiatives on top of LTS or the Long Term Sustainability Guidelines on space resources. Um, were discussed and put into process, as you said, or this 10 year process, what it took to to come to conclude the, the LTS and adapt it. So Japan is clearly paving the way here by setting your policy into law. So, mm -hmm. but what 
if other countries do not recognize Japan Japanese law. So uh, how how will you go yeah. from there? Well, of course, you know, there is no way to enforce law uh, to other uh, jurisdiction and mm -hmm. uh, and it is obvious, but, you know, whether Japan will do or not, there still isn't any rules for the activity of removal or the space resources. So I think, um, uh, again, as, as I said, you know, as we set up the um, stricter rules in place and, and, and show that it will work, then it will set the precedent and reference point. So um, I, I think it's, um, you know, we hope and crossing fingers, uh, we hope that other countries will follow. And that's, that's up to them. But at least we can say, hey, you are doing something that mm -hmm. is not as good as Japanese do. And that will be the international pressure in, in you know, that will be the sort of a, uh, that, that what, in, what I mean by reference point, that behavior can be compared to what Japan do. So mm -hmm. it is the responsibility of Japan to set up the highest standard uh, possible and to make sure that, you know, it will be the, uh, it will demonstrate the, the, um, the best way possible to set up the precedent. Thank you very much for clarifying that. Um, I mean, before we come to my last question, I will um, ask our, our audience to put in their questions and I'm quite sure there will be. I'm picking here the, the, the first one from Julian or Juliane, or as, as we would say it in German, Dam. If Japan sets stricter rules for transparency in space usage, would that have negative implications for Japanese business that companies from other countries would not have to face? How will Japanese industry react to those rules? I think that's a very interesting question. Yes, but uh, this is a very specific uh, cases. Um, you know, um, uh, it's it's astro scale, and uh, mm -hmm. and other uh, companies may be involved, but um, uh, at this moment, it, you know, the most um, advanced level. I mean, uh, the advanced preparedness is already done by the astro scale, and I think it's. Um, Yes, it's a it's a constraint, and uh, I, I I assume that the company doesn't like it because you know the company usually doesn't like any you know mm -hmm. regulations, but I think this is a guarantee for the activities. Uh, I, I think it is good for the Astro Scale or any other companies which are engaged in the um, uh, activity of removal, such as clear space in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is to, in a way, to, to, to guarantee that, you know, their action is not, uh, is not aiming for the, the um, malign intent or, you know, taking out some other countries, you know, operational satellites. It is just simply for the business to, uh, you know, to take out debris and get money mm -hmm. out of it. So this regulation will ensure that their existence as the benign business, uh, act, business entity, rather than the sort of a hidden, you know, uh, 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 sort of a space weapon hiding behind this masquerade of the, um, uh, uh, of the commercial company. So I think this regulation will, in the long term, uh, uh, make it better for the for the industry, uh, rather than you know uh, stricting you know the uh, constraining their behavior because you know it may increase the cost. They don't like it, but it's just a short term interest. And and but if you look at the long term, I think it uh, this regulation is necessary for the industry. That's that's right. I mean, we, we see increased costs on the one hand side for um, um, putting the orbit 
our cap capacities on on small satellites. But I mean, all these prices are going down for for a access to space for the materials for the satellites. So I think this increase that we we see for this additional capacity to actively re uh, um, remove the the debris or by by the orbiting is neglectable. Um, my last question to you. I mean, Japan is recognized for its great exploration ambitions, as we heard earlier today. Um, you joined Artemis um, in the, I think, in the first consorts, uh, in the first uh, round already. You're part of the ISS. Um, you announced a lunar base, plus uh, you have a number of commercial companies heading towards the moon or friends of iSpace and so on. And so on. So where can we see Japan's space activities in the next 10 years from now? I don't ask about 20 years, 30 years, Mars and beyond, but just in that what we hopefully both will, <laughs> where we will, will be alive. So Right. <laughs> well, I, I hope I, I'm alive in the next 10 years. But uh, yeah. yes, I, there, there are lots of things going on. First, it's a Mars. Uh, the Phobos uh, sample return is one thing. And this sample return is one of the strengths of Japan. And I think it will extend to uh, much other places, not just asteroid, but uh, hopefully in the Mars itself or, you know, Venus. You know, uh, I, I think the sample return is one thing. Um, the other thing, the big issue is the Artemis, uh, um, Artemis uh, plan. And uh, Japan is now planning to do a lot of activities. For example, Toyota announced the joint project with JAXA to have the pressurized uh, uh, rover vehicle in on, on the moon. And there are a number of Japanese companies uh, are, are planning to do the commercial businesses on the moon, like, uh, you know, the space farming or, uh, you know, the building, the uh, 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 construction uh, businesses on the moon for the mm -hmm. permanent um, um, exploration base or, or things like that. And also Japan is working with India to, to launch the um, uh, moon, another moon uh, exploration program outside of Artemis. So I think the moon is the, is the big hot issue for Japan for the next 10 years. And um, I, I think, um, you know, uh, for, the, for the government, it is the uh, more scientific missions, for example, building up the telescope in the other side of the moon, so that's another um, uh, uh, sort of an ambitious program, uh, which is not yet in, in any shape or form, but I think mm -hmm. this is one of the idea that, uh, you know, building up the, uh, uh, a telescope in the moon so that you don't have any, um, uh, you don't have any interference from the, you know, the uh, radio waves from Earth mm -hmm. or, you know, um, things like that. So I think, you know, the Mars, Moon are the two big things and sample return from uh, Phobos is the uh, immediate uh, plan for for the future. But uh, Artemis is now giving a, a very a strong um, imagination for the Japanese commercial companies like Toyota mm -hmm. and to, to, to be engaged in the space business. Yeah, I remember times when we want to put a German car on the moon as well. So, but <laughs> however, I'm afraid we have to come to an end. Even so, uh, I would like to continue this very inspiring talk with you. And because for me, it's 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 absolutely enlightening to learn so much um, new of what's going on in Japan. But be assured, we will follow up on these topics in our future space cafes and web talks and all the other formats. So. Um, some announcement are for for you are that are um, online with us. So the, this week we have another fantastic uh, space cafe coming up on Friday at 6 p.m. Uh, European time. Our next space cafe Canada, where Dr. Jessica West will talk with Tim Copra um, of MDA about uh, robotic missions are uh, from Canada. 
on the 22nd, so next week, I have the chance to talk with Danica Remy, the uh, uh, co-founder of the Asteroid Day, about the Asteroid Day, the upcoming Asteroid Day on the 30th of June. And next week, we also have the Space Cafe uh, Brazil. Ian Grossner will talk with our great friend, Andre Ripple. And on the 29th, uh, what is in two weeks from now, I have the chance to speak in my 33 minutes with Niklas Ninas. And that's some, some, some name you should recognize and, and keep in mind. Niklas is a member of the European Parliament, of the Green, member of the Green Party, and he takes care about space on the European level on the, in the European Parliament. I think that's a very interesting talk um, in that context. So on the 1st of July, we have the next Space Cafe Scotland coming up and then I speak with Ronald van den Breggen, ex Leo Sat um, on the 6th of July. And then on the 8th of July, we have our next Space Cafe Germany. So far, all about our lineup. All events are going to be online on Eventbrite, or they are already. As always, we would like to hear your feedback. So please check in with us on Twitter, on Facebook, or LinkedIn. Or if you have a guest of, of your choice where you would like to see, in our space cafes, please let us know. Don't forget to sign up to our daily or bi-weekly newsletters. And if you like to treat yourself with something special, become a space watcher today. Your support will help us. Take your credit card and visit our fan shop at shop.spacewatch.global. And I'm quite sure I said it before, but it's the truth. We need your support. Thank you very much for all of you for your interest today. And thank you Kazutu for your inspiring talk and being my guest. Thanks again to the entire team behind the scenes for doing their great job day by day, event by event, week by week again. I hope you all would stay safe and healthy. Thanks for joining us and hope to see you next week. In the meantime, visit our website and follow us on social media. And don't forget, become a space watcher. Thank you very much. Kazuko. Thank you, Thank you very much. <laughs>